Hey guys and welcome to the second part of the Resurgence. I'm doing a card review of all the cards that were released and that is the Resurgence completed now. So the Resurgence is finished and we have every card that exists in the expansion which means a lot more new decks will be cropping up in our metagame. So let's get to it and let's take a look at these new cards. Alright, let's kick things off with the neutral cards. Yak's got a lot of support uh, during the second part, so we can take a look at that. Then we'll take a look at the green and the blue. So to kick things off, we have the Roman Yak, a 2 Feria 1-1 one, one with a gift. Create a, a Prairie Dash 1. I think this card is really good. Uh, it does open up some of the problems that, well, it does resolve some of the problems I had with Yaks before, mainly being the Emerald Yak. Having to summon that baby yak on a neutral tile. Now the Roman yak can create those neutral tiles and make sure that baby yak can come down. So great synergy with the emerald yak already, which I really like about it. It's a two theory of 1-1. One, one. So it's a little on the weak side stat-wise. Uh, it's basically a farm boy, but it does have dash one, so it can move around a bit. And it does create a land. So I feel this card is just pretty solid for its cost. You get a creature. You get an extra land and it's got a bit of mobility. It also has synergies with other cards like the Mother. So when this card dies, it's going to reduce the Mother of all Yaks cost. Uh, you can use Yak Shepherd, which we'll get to shortly on this card, giving it charge two and three attack. So it basically becomes a Wind Soldier, which is pretty cool. Uh, but another thing you can do is that you can use it as a sacrifice target as well. I think Demon Wrangler might just find its way into Yak decks in the future. Uh, just because of this card, I think if you're going to run this, uh, Demon Wrangler could be a good shout because you can sack the Baby Yaks and you can sack this card as well. And it does collect Feria, so unlike the Baby Yak, uh, the Roman Yak collects Feria, which means it can trigger the Sapphire Yak. So Roman Yak just a good tool for the Yak Arsenal. It also has synergy with other Yak cards as well and some of the new ones that have been released. So very cool. I am a big fan of this card. So Yulani, a defender of Oversky, a 2 Fairy 4, Wild 2-4. If Yulani is your only creature, this gains Taunt, Protection, and Divine. So just a very durable card. Uh, just a great way to get a collector back down, which can't be removed. It's very durable. I like this card. I think it's very cool. Uh, it's just a, a great way to get back onto the board. Uh, it reminds me a bit of a bit like Leia in a way. It's just a very sturdy card that offers board presence. Uh, it does have quite a requirement to get all its triggers off, like the Torn Protection Divine. But a two Feria two four is, is good, right? We just got the Roman Yak. That was a two Feria one one. This is a two Feria two four. So Yulani is back. You know, we haven't seen much of Yulani since the Over Sky. Uh, but yeah, Yulani. I think this card's really good. I'm not sure where it fits yet. It definitely fits in Rakoan decks because it's a neutral. Uh, but you could use it in mid-range decks, control decks. You probably won't see it in Rush. Uh, but if you are looking for a sturdy harvester at a cheap price, Yulani is definitely a card to consider. So up next is, I think this card is really cool. So Yak Shepherd, a free fairy, a free wild, two free. Gift. Give two friendly yaks plus two plus zero and charge two until the end of turn. So yaks have their own specific mobility now. A bit like Silent Horsemaster. A bit more durable than Silent Horsemaster, which is great. It's a two free instead of a free two. One less charge, but you can hit two yaks with it. So you, we're sacrificing one charge here and a wild cost. And we're gaining a wild cost in order to give plus two attack and mobility to two yaks. So like I said, it can turn the roaming yak into like a mini wind soldier. It can turn all of your yaks into mobile threats. Really good buff to the yak subtype. I'm really excited to see how this card is utilized. I've been running it as a free of in my yak builds that I've been experimenting with. I don't feel it quite there yet. I'm still kind of working on it, uh, but I feel this card's really strong for yaks. Get their own mobility trick and the plus two attack and hitting two targets. Just a lot of benefits to this card. It gives running the Yak subtype a really good trick to use in combat and a way to get around the board. And speaking of Yaks, we have another Yak. So we have a Flying Over Sky Yak. It's a four Feria, one Wild, two Four. Has plus two, plus two, while you control six Prairies. So 
The Romagnac does synergize with this really well. We already know that Prairies are pretty important for some of the other Yak cards, like the Emerald Yak. This will gain the power-up as soon as you control the Prairies. It's not a gift ability, so this power-up will come and go, depending on how many neutral tiles you control. So if you do decide to turn one of your neutrals into a special land and you were controlling six, it will lose its buff. If Beiru's production ability turns your neutrals into lakes, it will lose its buff. So it does. It only retains the plus two, plus two if you are controlling those neutrals. As soon as they've been taken over by a special land, you're going to have to rebuild those neutrals to get the buff. So it will just shrink. It will lose those stats. Now, I don't know how that affects it if it's taken damage already. So I assume if you deal four damage to the Yak and you then get rid of one of the Prairies, it will just die, I assume. It's, it's a very, very specific condition that, which would be very hard for me to test, but I assume it will because it'll lose its stats. But that's something to consider. I don't, I'm not sure how you would be able to transform lands outside of Beirut. Maybe like uh, Imperial Engineer on Beirut. <laughs> Some anti Oversky Yak tech there. But yeah, that's something to consider as well. So be careful with this card. I have done it myself when I've been playing. Where I'm just like, oh, I could put a nice special land here. And then I've lost that power up on the Oversky Yak. But this is a good card. It definitely has some great synergy with Roman Yak. It gives you a reason to build neutrals since you'll need one of each special to get your Yaks online, or at least the full Yak package. So you, what you can do, which I was, which I did with Roman Yak on as a second player, I went double neutral, explore Roman Yak into neutral, and then I was like two neutrals away from Sky Yak coming online. So that's a really cool thing you can do, do on turn two with Roman Yak to get this card going as quickly as possible. But a solid card, I think it's really good. We'll have to see how it influences Yak decks going forward. Lamacord. <laughs> now this card is is just funny. I just didn't I just didn't expect it. A five area, two wilds, five five. So good stats for its cost. Combat. Each player draws a card and gains two life. So it's a bit like our old friend the storyteller. But instead, it's a combat trigger. Now, I think this is a great card for Rapala because we've seen some kind of Rapala hand dump cards before. Uh, this could also synergize to some of the new yellow cards that came out in the last part, such as the Dusk, uh, Duskbringer Wraith. So if you're looking to create that kind of hand disruption strategy, uh, Lamacorn definitely could be worth a try. I haven't played with the card yet. It's something I do need to experiment with. Uh, before I make my mind up on how good it is, uh, but definitely a very cool card. I love the artwork as well. Look at that. Look at that face. Just full of sass. The sassiest llama I've ever seen. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool card. Uh, we'll have to see where it fits. Definitely Rapala decks and maybe Yellow Hand control decks. Uh, but outside of that, I'm not sure it'll have much of a home. Uh, but we'll see. So the last neutral... The legendary of the second part, Bannon. Now we got to see Bannon as the cosmetic set for the Resurgence. And I was like, straight away, I was like, who's Bannon? Like, who is this guy? And he is the captain of Radiance. It's a 7 Fairy of 4 5. So a bit understated for its cost, but its gift ability is where the payoff is. If you have no creatures left in your deck, shuffle Radiance Imperial Airship and 10 random neutral creatures into your deck. They gain plus two plus two. So this is a payoff card as I like to call them. You maybe tweak your deck in a way where it doesn't have creatures and you can use stuff like Battle Toads and Flight of the Manta, Spell Whirl. Now, these cards all create creatures in their events. So that's a way you can get Bannon to be a bit more consistent. And then the, the, the payoff is you gain a lot of overstated creatures in your deck. Now I don't know if it's worth it, personally. I have tried a Bannon deck with just event-based creatures, and it I never got around to playing it because I felt my deck was so weak. Bannon never really got to uh, do its thing. I guess you could... You could definitely build, like, a Curious Biomancer deck, and that's a way you can get creatures in your deck and out of your deck in order to get the Bannon gift. Uh, maybe like an event burn deck that has a backup plan of Bannon 
and you gain the Radiance and you gain those extra creatures to boot. But so far for me, I don't think the payoff is quite there. If you guys come up with any decks that use Bannon which you feel are quite good and quite consistent, by all means leave a comment. I'd very much be interested to see if you have any ideas of where to work this card. But currently for me, I haven't really figured out a way. I think maybe somewhere in the future someone will come up with a good Bannon deck. But for me right now, I can't see where it fits. But that covers all the neutral cards. Let's move on to the green cards. All right, guys, let's take a look at these ones. Chrysalis to start things off at zero. Cost one forest, two life structure. Swallow a friendly creature. Production, the swallowed creature gains plus one, plus one. Activate, destroy the, the Chrysalis. Now, I think this card has a lot of potential. My problem is with the card, do I really want it to take up one of my deck slots? So the way this card I think is useful is taking your creatures out of situations where they're unfavored. Now there are situations in Feria where you'll have a creature in a spot and your opponent plays say like a ground shaker or something. Let's say you have a, say for example you have a, an Emerald Jack down and your opponent plays a ground shaker near it but the positioning of the yak, the Emerald Yak, it's in such a way where you can't escape the wrath of the Grand Shaker on the follow-up. Maybe it's usually in between the wells. I find this situation. So your creature uh, basically is a lamb to the slaughter or a yak to the slaughter in the case of the Emerald Yak, and it's gonna die. Now, one thing I think Chrysalis is very good at is taking those creatures out of those situations, so you can swallow it on a tile on your map so you can reposition it so you get that repositioning from the swallow it gains plus one plus one so it gains something extra as well gain some extra stats and then you can activate and destroy it and the yak comes back out or the emerald yak in that example comes back out and it's out of harm's way so that's why i feel this card is going to be strong it's going to be a way to protect your creatures from difficult situations now, it's a zero Feria card, which is also very good, so it doesn't cost anything. You're essentially gaining a campfire for nothing, and you get to reposition your creature. So I think it has a lot of potential with board positioning, which I really like. This is the thing I like about this card. But like I said, my only issue is it takes up deck slots. I always find my Feria decks these days are so tight on slots. Will this have enough impact to take one of those valuable slots? I don't know. It definitely needs some testing first, but as far as positional advantage goes, I think this card has tremendous potential, and I'm excited to see what players do with it, and maybe I'll be able to find a way to utilize this myself. I think this can fit in any deck that uses green. It's only one forest, which is really good as a structure. It can be summoned on any tile, so lots of flexibility there. Definitely a great way to save your creatures if they're in very hairy situations. So the Zephyr Zolpine is next. A uh, Volpine, sorry, Zol. Zephyr Volpine, a free fairy of one forest, free free. Whenever this moves into a forest, you may teleport it to a forest you control. So there's a new kind of theme with these two cards here. The uh, Chief of the Bright Fox Tribe and our foxy little friend here where you can move onto your own forest and then you can relocate it to another. So this opens up a lot of different lines of play. Uh, extra collection, uh, moving into defensive positions, moving into aggressive positions, uh, lining up this creature to clear other opposing creatures with power-ups potentially, or maybe just getting out of dodge much like the Chrysalis. So there's a bit, a bit of a theme with greens, some of greens cards during this part uh, where their creatures can relocate so I think this card's got a lot of potential. It's it's decent. It's a free fairy of free free for one forest. You can get it down turn one. And its ability becomes a bit more relevant later when you have your forest spread around the map. So I think that's probably where, what holds this card back a little bit. Is I think it's a card that wants to see like the mid game where you can utilize its ability. But I think, again, uh, another green card that has enormous potential given the right situation. Uh, but I'm not sure if it'll find slots in just because I feel that like it's a card that benefits later rather than in the early game. But who knows? Prove me wrong, guys. Prove me wrong. Priest of Everlife. So this, to me, straight up, looks like a sacrifice card. Free Fairy 2 Forest 1-1. One, one. 
gift, give the next creature you draw plus two, plus four. So the next creature you draw gains Elderwood Embrace, essentially. So it's an Elderwood Embrace, but with variance. So you're basically sacrificing the choice of where the Elderwood Embrace goes to get a 1-1, which you can use for other cards. So the Meek, the new the new Meek card that gives a 1-1 a plus 2 plus 2 in Divine. That's where some potential can come in on the Priest of Everlife. I think it's a really good sack card. It's kind of like, it's like a, a new version of the, what's it called? Is it a her, is she a hermit? Let me find her a minute. She's down here somewhere. Yeah, so it's kind of a different version of this, right? Very similar. Rather than, but this, the problem with this card is you need a creature on the board in order to get this trigger. So you can actually play around this quite well. Whereas as this version, the next creature you draw gains plus two plus four now this could have, this actually could have good synergy with stuff like longhorn jack uh because that will empower that and then when that dies that will empower something else so anything it has some it has some synergies outside of sacrifice but i think to me this is a sacrifice card just because it puts a body on the field uh you get an additional benefit when it comes into play and then you can use it for your doom gate your demon wranglers or whatever you want to play in order to sacrifice it because it's just a 1-1. One, one. So that's where I feel Priest of Everlife will find a home if it does find a home. I really like this art as well. It's got all these cute little creatures around. This, this little doggo here as well. But yeah, really cool. So Verdurin Emissary, a 5 fear, 1 forest, 4, 5, last words, give plus 1, plus 1 to all creatures in hand. So a bit like Eridan. So Eridan gives plus one, plus one to all creatures and uh, cards, well, all cards in your hand and deck. This only gives to all creatures in your hand. There could be a future archetype for green where you empower your deck and hand, so you make those spiders better. It could fit in kind of like a combat-based deck. Uh, no, no, well, not combat. It's called fight, I guess. So like frog tossers, spiders, if we see more of those type of cards in the future, I think this card would definitely benefit them. And that's kind of where I see, that's where I see Verdure and Emissary, kind of hand buffing, and being able to buff your hand. And I think the problem I have with this card is it's a bit situational, because if you don't have any creatures in hand, you don't get any value out of it. I think you need to have at least one creature in hand to get the value from it. Uh, but it's not a card, it's a card you want to die, so it's a bit like Oakland. It's, it's kind of like a card you need to die in order to get its benefit. And Oakland's another very similar card to it, right? A 5 fear, a 1 5, but it gives a much bigger stat boost. So there could be a hand buff uh, deck in the future that uh, could benefit from this. If you guys have had any any ideas with this card, like I said, just leave a comment. If, you, if any cards come up and you think of any archetypes or any ideas, get on the hub, build a deck, let me have a look. I'm very interested to see what you guys cook up. So the only elemental legendary of the set. Now green, uh, green got this card, but blue, red, and yellow didn't get any legendaries. Very interesting. So a six fairy of four forest six six. Uh, Dwardia? I want to call it Dwardia? Dwardia? Let's call it Dwardia. Chief of the Bright Fox tribe, which is a Rakoan tribe, since this is a Rakoan. Whenever Dwardia moves into a forest, you may teleport him to another forest you control. If you do, gains plus one, plus one. So very similar to this card, the, uh, the Volpine, but it gains plus one, plus one. And it's a bit bigger in stats. It's not a free free, it's a six, six. I think this card has a lot of potential, especially with all the forest ramp that's happening in green right now. It's not difficult to get these four forests anymore. I think it's just a solid card. Six Faria, six, six, good stats for six cost. And it gets better as it teleports around the field. So it's actually a Rakoin riding on this card here. So it's this, it's this guy is riding on one of these. So that's kind of thematic of its ability in the artwork. But yeah, it's just a strong card. It, it, it's got mobility built into it, so it can definitely have influence around the board. Just remember that you have to move onto a forest to teleport. So once you've teleported, you won't be able to move again. So keep that in mind. You want to teleport right next to a creature you want to fight, or you want to teleport onto those wells. 
So that's something to consider with this ability. It does need to move first in order to trigger the teleport. But yeah, just solid card. I, I'm, I'm wondering if it will see this in green decks in the future. Uh, this might be a new option over Runin, but only time will tell. I think it's good. I, I would definitely play this. All right, so I actually think this is the uh, the best card Green got in this in this part. The Blossoming Kodama, a six Feria five Forest five seven Gift Create Free Forest. Now, Forest Ram hasn't really been a thing for Green, and but this card opens up a lot of opportunities to play Highland cost cards. Now I've been playing kind of what I've called Big Green, a big mono green deck with lots of big creatures with high land costs. So stuff like the uh, Colossus of Primeval Colossus. I've been running Moby now in green. Moby has been amazing. I, I can't believe how good Moby has been since I've been put into green. And this is the reason why I've been playing it. And I actually think Mono Green can benefit from the Tree of Everlife now because it can ramp forests through the Kodama. There's the Everbloom Wisp as well. So this card benefits from the Kodama, whenever you create a forest, this gains plus one, plus one. So another way to increase uh, power on this card now, you get plus three, plus three after playing a Kodama with this. So another card that gets a benefit from it. And we also have the Oak Father as well. So Oak Father gains much more life as, and it's much easier to gain life. So I actually think this card is really, this card is amazing, it's awesome. It's been a massive buff to green. It's opened up a lot more options in how to build green. And unfortunately, Tarim, I think this is a, this is just a better version of Tarim. But yeah, very solid. This guy as well. You can get a, you can get to a point we have six spheres, seven fourteens. It's pretty good in my opinion. So yeah, I really think uh, Blossoming Kodama is great. It's opening a lot of forest ramp options for green going forward. And I've been really enjoying this card, and I think that's the future of green now. We're going to see forest ramps, we're going to maybe see stuff like Moby, maybe even Tree of Everlife, crop into decks. And uh, yeah, it's just such a good card. Just something green needed, I think, for, for mono at least. And it's going to be a huge benefit to the archetype. So that wraps up green. Let's move on to blue. Alright guys, the blue cards to wrap things up, plus the blue-green cards that were added as well. We got two of them in this part. Let's take a look. So Bloated Toad, a one Feria, two Lake, free free jump. Last words, summon a 2-2 two, two frog with jump for your opponent in this space. Now, a one Feria free free is very good. It's very good stats. The only problem is giving your opponent a frog with jump can be very, very bad considering the positioning. Now, if this creature gets answered, that could set up potential collectors or potential threats that you have to deal with later on. Now, I think that Bloated Toad is a push to make blue competitive in the aggro strategy, but I'm not sure if this card is really worth it at the moment. Maybe blue green could benefit from it because they have spiders which can kill the frogs or maybe even like a, a blue yellow or a blue red. Maybe a more aggressive mid-range blue red or blue yellow could benefit from this because they have soul drains and cypher's wrath and I think that's I think that's where the the cost is is added onto this card, right? You pay one fairy for a free free, but then you pay two to three fairy to remove the frog later on. So you, you, it's kind of you get a cheap, get a cheap fret, but you have to make up that investment later, which is good design in my opinion. I, I like this kind of design. It's like, uh, okay, you get early tempo now, but that tempo will come back. You have to pay for that tempo later with removal or with creatures going into those frogs. You have to respect the frog that comes out of it. So I, I think this is great design. It's, it's a good tempo card and we may see it in tempo or aggro decks in the future. Uh, but right now I don't think like it's worth it. That's I think that's my problem. It doesn't feel like it's worth it right now, especially considering how powerful some of the other blue cards are in the set. Now I would I would argue and say this is the best blue card that has been released in this part. A two Feria, one lake, 
two two dash one at the end of your turn a random adjacent friendly creature swallows this and gains plus one plus one so it's a two fairy two two that's good stats for two fairy it's one lake it's very easy to play it has mobility so it can get into positions where it can trigger its end of turn ability which it swallows so basically this is a two fairy campfire which sounds bad it's a two fairy campfire and a two two so okay Actually, let me let me scrap that. It's a two faria campfire, which gives you a two two. But the best thing about this card is when the creature is killed, it just pops back out. And then if it isn't answered, it can just get swallowed by another one of your creatures and give that plus one plus one again. This card is fantastic in jump because battle toads, like all these cheap little creatures, start to get that benefit. And it's it does snowball quite a bit because. Once you kill that creature, you still have to deal with the animated banquet or it's going to gain value again. It's going to get swallowed by another creature on the following turn. I think this card is incredible. It's just so strong. And another thing as well, which I came to learn, play Moby recently, the card that swallows this can't be swallowed by Moby or Crystal Flower. So if there's a creature you want to protect from the swallow mechanic, you can get it to eat the banquet and then you can't be swallowed because creatures cannot swallow creatures that have already swallowed something. No, it's a very weird way to get around that word. In. Uh, but yeah, if your creature has already swallowed a target, it cannot be swallowed by anything else. And I've had a couple of games where I've been playing mono green with Moby and I'm just like, right, I really need to swallow X because it's a big threat. I go to swallow it and it's already sold the banquet and I forgot about it and it's messed up my turn. So something to consider. I think this is the best card Blue got in a set. I think it's really powerful and it can be splashed into other decks as well at one lake. So it's very flexible. I'm, I'm curious to see how other decks utilize this. I've seen Mono Blue Jump playing this deck uh, card and it's been very good so far. But again, other decks can use it. I'm very curious to see they, how they do it. But yeah, definitely for me, the best card of blue. Maybe one of the best cards of the set. Triton Tactician. So another Triton. So again, the Triton subtype is definitely uh, being boosted here. Uh, blue Jump is getting kind of its own subtype, which is quite nice. Uh, Free Faria, 2 Lake, 2 4. So good stats already. Jump, mobile, great stats. Game plus 1 plus zero for each adjacent friendly triton so as long as this gains plus one i think it's good value because you get a free four with jump if it gains anything more it's just an extra bonus if you can make this a four four you essentially get a triton warrior for free fairy which is really good if you can get this up to a four four i think that's a sweet spot anything extra is just a bonus but i think just plus one is also good enough as well but four four is really solid so uh, another jumper another thing that can synergize with triton trainer uh, you can also use this to buff tide lord which is also another new triton which we'll look at next so just a solid creature a uh, solid stats having four life and can get more more powerful and has mobility so a great addition to blue jump now this is the uh the blue jump finisher and a good alternative to Wave Crash Colossus, or maybe something you play alongside Wave Crash Colossus. So a 5 Faria, 2 Lake, 2 Wild, 5-5 five, five, Jump can be summoned adjacent to friendly Tritons. If it is, this gains plus 1, plus 1. So for me, this is definitely a blue jump card, but also could be a green blue jump card as well. That wild requirement uh, definitely gives us a bit of flexibility. Uh, that green blue jump has been a solid deck in the last six months uh, created by Xged, and we've seen it actually crop up in tournament recently over the beast variant so blue green definitely has a few different ways it can go when it comes to building its archetypes you could go like jump you could go beasts you can do meek now savior of the meek which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, you could probably do a, a blue green ramp again now so there's a lot of cool options Blue Green has now, and Triton Lord uh, benefits both Blue Jump and the Blue Green Jump, and I think it's solid. I think it's a solid card. As long as it gets one trigger, you get a five fairy of six six, and I think six attack is. I've always said this. I think six attack is really relevant 
inferior. That might change as we get more expansions, but currently for me, six attack is super relevant. So I think this card is very good. It's been a big problem for me, and especially when you give it that animated banquet, because I've tried to swallow this with Moby in my games recently, and it's usually eaten a banquet and become a 7-7. Seven, seven. So a banquet can turn this into a virgin force. I think this is a good card. I think it's really solid. Blue got some very good tools for jump and blue jump. Uh, just a great card. I I'm really happy about it. Okay, looking the last Phantom. I think this is probably the most talked about card of the expansion, considering it did have a change. Uh, so a 5 fairy, 5 Lake 3, 5 Gift Transform an enemy creature into a 5 free <laughs> looking, looking glass Phantom. I'm not going to even try and say that word backwards. So before, you used to be able to change any creature, but now it can only be enemy creatures. So some players have said this is the new Frogify, others have said it's just not that good. It's hard to say right now, I haven't played with this card enough to really judge it, but I think it's solid. Is it better than Mirror Phantasm? I don't know, it's definitely different. 5-3 is just one life more for it than a Battletoad. It's at five lakes, so it's not like you can, you can get Flame Burst involved with this. It's definitely a mono blue card. So maybe that's where the restriction lies. Maybe if it had a wild cost, it may be a little stronger uh, because you could splash it in other decks. Uh, but as a mono blue card, maybe that's where its weakness lies. You know, we already have Frogify. We already have Humble Envisions. Will this card be good enough to fit into kind of greedy blue land strategy? I don't know. I'm not sure. I think it's okay. But I think this is a card that only time will tell. We'll have to see how the competitive players exploit this card and see if they even bother with it. I think uh, the competitive scene definitely will define this card if it does become very strong. So last of the blue cards, and this is a very curious card, uh, the Coral Polywog. It's a 7 Feria 2 Lake 5-7. This creature can collect the turn you play it. Gift, you may move this creature's land. So another way to set up Mystic Beast, if you remember the Oversky Toe Ship, it's very similar to that card. Uh, but Oversky Toe Ship can continue to move land after it's played. This is only a one-time thing. So if you can play this in between the wells, it's actually pretty good. It's actually pretty good value. It's a five fairy of five seven. If you can't, it's probably quite bad. So I think that's where this card, this card only really shines if you can get it to double collect at least, or at least collect one. If it can't collect, I don't think it's that great, but it does set up Mystic Beast Lands. So that could be something to consider if you're really looking to get in between those wells. This could be definitely be a card. It's a bit like Prophet of Tides, but like a, a really beefy Prophet of Tides is a 5-7. But yeah. It's a card. I don't know if it'll see much play, but definitely for me right now, Mystic Beast is a, something it can set up. Axe Grinder is another thing it can set up as well, so anything that utilizes enemy wells, or just a way for you to get in between the wells much quicker. So Coral Polywog looks okay. Not entirely sure how strong it'll be. Maybe someone will be able to utilize this in the future. All right, the last two cards, which are the dual color cards, Right, let's talk about the Meek first. I, I have a lot to say about this card. So let's let's talk about the Meek first. So Saviour of Meek, I really like this card. Free Feria, 2 Forest, 2 Lake, 1, 2. Gift, give plus 2, plus 2, and Divine to another friendly creature with exactly one attack. I think this card is really cool. I actually hope we get to see more synergy with the one attack creatures in the future. I really feel like we need another card that does stuff for one attack creatures to really make an archetype around this. But what I've been playing recently is decks with Unlikely Hero. Given Unlikely Hero Divine is really good. Tax Collector, because why not, is a combat creature that generates Feria, very strong mechanic. Ludoan, make a Ludoan more durable. Uh, Ludoan I think is where this card wants to be with. Uh, Ludoran can get a lot of value if it's left unchecked and given it that divine and plus two plus two will make it far more durable. Ruby fish, you can give it to ruby fish as well. So if you're playing like a green blue, you could definitely give it to ruby fish. So there's, there's a few targets in the game that can benefit from this. Ludoran is definitely one of them. I actually think uh, there's a few yellow things that could get benefits from this, like demonic salmon. But it is a green-blue card, so 
do you really want to play Demonic Salmon? Fairies are another card, uh, not necessarily the, this just this yellow one, but also benefit from it. The archers, so there's a few things in yellow that definitely benefit from the card. It's just, it is quite restrictive as a green-blue. Uh, Shaitan Assassin. Can you imagine a Shaitan Assassin with Divine Protection and plus two, plus two? It'd be an absolute nightmare to get rid of. So I feel like yellow actually has a lot of the better one attack cards. So maybe if this was like one forest, one lake, two wild or something like that, it would be uh, a bit more beneficial. But I really like it. I, I think this card's really cool. I've tried it with Ludoan. I've had a little bit of success with it. But I would definitely like to see in the future like maybe another card that benefits the one attack creatures and we can maybe see a much more consistent archetype being built from the meat. So yeah, if you come up with any deck ideas for this, maybe you can find a tricolor deck that benefits with the archons and stuff, I don't know. But like I said, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm excited to see what decks come from this and if no, no decks do come from it, I hope we get more cards like this in the future. All right, guys. The last card, like I said, I have a lot to say about this card, and it's not good. Victory Celebration. A zero cost, one forest, one lake, two wild. When you play this card for the rest of the game, each player gains one extra Feria each turn. Okay, where do I start? So my first problem with this card is you have to put in your deck. That, that is the first problem. And this, 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 this problem is linked to everything else about it. So you have to invest deck slots in this card in order to play it. So this is taking slots. It costs four wildlands to get going. So it's very, you have to land ramp before you even see a benefit of this. It costs zero. I think that's pretty good. That's one of the good things about the card. But this is the problem. For the rest of the game, each player gains one extra fairy each turn. So not only do you put this card in your deck, it takes up pressure slots. You have to play this card, so you lose hand advantage when you play this card. Your opponent benefits from it first. So when you play this card, the first player to gain that one extra fairy is your opponent. You're paying zero fairy. You're paying. You're losing hand advantage put in cards in your deck to give your opponent a one fairy advantage over you. See see my problem? Now, okay, let's look at the benefits. Your deck gets more fairy so you can play greedier cards, sure. But your opponent's deck also gets more fairy so they can still respond to that. Maybe, maybe there is a benefit to this where you know, it it gives you enough area that you can just slam massive greedy threats that your opponent can't answer. But initially playing this card, your opponent benefits from it first. That's a big problem for me. I don't want to put a card in my deck that I don't even see the benefit from. I, I am a big fan of mutual benefit cards. I think they're a cool design. Like, uh, you play a card, both of you gain the benefit, but... The player who plays the card should gain that little bit extra. They should gain like a creature. So if this was a creature, if this was a zero fairy or one one, I'd probably get on board with it because you gain a creature, it can harvest fairy, and it's something your opponent has to answer. But that's not the case here. You're playing a card for your opponent to gain extra fairy than you before you benefit from it. It's not mutually beneficial. That is beneficial for your opponent at the start. Now, Okay, it could snowball, right? It could get to a point later on in the match where this benefits you more. Sure, you you might have to you might have to drag out a match before you see the benefits, the, before you can reap the rewards. You know, uh, I have that extra fairy, so I can play this more expensive card, right? You could essentially extend the curve of your deck by one fairy extra. So uh, a way to look at that, so say you were playing, I don't know, let's, let's have an example. So say you were playing a five area creature and you played this on five for reason X, like because you know that you're collecting a area to be able to play this quite consistently. This can now become a six area creature because that extra one area will benefit you and let you push your curve up. So as a 
this might be like a better bargain card. Like, I don't know, this is, like I said, my problem is your opponent gave benefits from it first and you had to put, you had to play this card from your hand, lose hand advantage, and you had to put in your deck and lose slots in the deck. So I am not a fan of this card at all. I wouldn't, I, prove me wrong guys, prove me wrong. That's all that I'd love to be proved wrong here. I'd love to see a situation where this card is good. If you guys can do it, by all means, I'd love for you to do it. For you to do it. But initially, looking at this card and after playing this card, I actually played this card and I felt awful after I played it. I don't like it. If I was to change this card, I would say zero Feria, gain two Feria for the rest of the turn. Each play games one or zero feria one one creature or two two creature and then the rest of the text i feel that the player who plays this card must gain something first if they don't gain anything first it doesn't seem worth it so that's why as you can see i thought about this card a lot but yeah that does wrap things up uh, and a victory celebration for the release of resurgence i think this by far is my favorite expansion and i feel that there are there are definitely foundations being laid by some of the card design for uh, future expansion. We saw Yaks in the Fall of Everlife, and now we're seeing that subtype expanded on in Resurgence. There are other different, uh, kind of not subtypes, but archetypes that have potential. Like these guys, you know, the hand, the, the hand disruption archetype. We have the new Ignis stuff like the Igni uh, archetype as well. We also have this, like the Savior, the Meek. The Tritons got a lot in blue, so nothing really expanded for blue. But for green, uh, we also got a lot of hand buffing and like cards like this. So I feel that there's definitely a lot of potential for the future to expand on some of the foundations that were laid by the design team this expansion and that's why I think it's my favorite expansion so far because it just creates so many exciting possibilities for now but and also in the future and that wraps up this card review I hope you guys enjoyed it and have gained some ideas uh, from some of my reviews of these cards I'm excited to see what decks you guys cook up by all means leave a comment with a link from the hub if you're looking uh, to show me a deck the best way I can look at them uh, if there are any cards that you I've said are bad or good and you want to prove me wrong by all means You know, like I said leave a comment I want to hear your feedback and how you guys feel about this set One thing to consider as well that the new elements puzzle expansion came out re with research part 2 It is a separate DLC. It offers a lot of puzzles. Let me just show you guys quickly uh, You can actually find it in your play tab so if you go to, uh, yep, if you go to go to play, you'll notice there's a new, there's a, there's a new section here called elements and you get these, you can get these guys, uh, for free. You get the first part for free. So if you want to try them out, see how you feel, but then you can unlock these later as well. And you get some cool rewards like mythic chests and this card back is beautiful, by the way. I, I really like this card back. Uh, the kind of the theme of this element here. I really like this is a card back as well, and I really want this one uh, But yeah, be sure to check that out if you are interested in the theory of puzzles If you have enjoyed them in the past be sure to get that out on the Steam store You can get that right now and yeah enjoy some of the puzzles There's some really cool names to the puzzles as well If you remember my S of, well my video on S of Mill He even has his own puzzle now, so you can check that out if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, drop a subscribe to keep up to date of when our content goes live. Last week, I took a look at Teddy's lineup for Crucible, which was featured in Cypher's Open, and he won the event with it. Now, we've just had a new part of the expansion, but some of these decks will still be relevant, and you can expand upon them. So if you're curious, you can check those videos out. But I will be taking a look at some new decks for the next couple of videos for this week, so be sure to check them out as well. So until next time, guys, take care, and I hope you enjoy the Resurgence Part 2.